least one page to make sure that we're seeing everything. All right, yeah, it's loading. I'm a little behind right now. Um, okay. See the flips? Yes, we're seeing the flips, yep. All right, beautiful. Um, so uh, before we dive into our today's topic, is uh, we're going to spend a, a chunk of time on the um, the local fees and the local licensing uh, process, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about um, state fees, including uh, some projected budget numbers, and then also um, <coughs> uh, I sent around everyone a survey of fees from other states, so you can just take a look at that and get a sense of like where these fees are um, in, in other states. So um, we'll talk about that, but before we get into that, um, just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about kind of updates on, on where we are. Um, obviously, we ran out of time on the last uh, call when we were talking about license types. Um, so, and obviously we're uh, short on time all through this, uh, this initial uh, recommendations on fees for uh, October 1. Um, so what I was thinking, and uh, I think is what we'll, we'll do unless anyone on the subcommittee has major objections, but we'll go through, we'll kind of table the remaining conversation from last week for the time being. We'll go through um, local stuff today and the state budgets. Um, and then our goal, we'll have some We'll have to get some work in over the next few days, but we'll be to kind of put all of this information that we've talked about into a, a document that you guys can look at on, on fee recommendations, um, just like an outline of fee recommendations for the license types that we've talked about um, and, and start talking about that uh, on Thursday. Um, and they basically reserve Thursday's meeting and the meeting uh, on Monday to kind of go over that, um, incorporating your thoughts, feedback, changes, things along those lines. Um, so that we'll all be having, because I feel like a lot of our holdup so far has been, we've been talking about things conceptually, um, this will have some, um, some, some structure to look at and, and things that can be directly commented on. So hope that works uh, for everyone. Does anyone have any issues with that as a, as a plan? Hearing none, um, we will uh, uh, move on. Um, so, and then just, as always, here's the, uh, the report language that we're building up to. Today we're gonna finally talk about uh, some of the stuff that we've been talking about, how the legislature in this report has asked the board to, to recommend fees that are, are covering uh, all of the costs um, uh, that of their, their operations. Um, there's also, as you can see, there's um, they have to have uh, the local fees to be charged and that the uh, local fee is kind of based on the, the cost incurred by the municipality. So those are kind of the, the chunk of what we'll be talking about today. Um, and this is just some of the other uh, other language um, about the, the local fees and then uh, there was too much there to, to link, but just in case anyone, I'm sure you've all read it, but the, the local control stuff is, uh, that's the, the link to the, um, the chapter on, on local control. So uh, we might as well dive right in. Um, to, to local fees. So where, and this is probably a little bit more of a, a freewheeling um, discussion than some of the others, uh, because we've been trying to figure out exactly how to um, uh, try to account for all of the costs and fees. But um, so what we, kind of what we were thinking was, or how we think this should be approached, uh, is that uh, we need to come up with fees that cover the costs of operating these businesses locally. Um, but we also have to remember that all of the fees that are associated with operating a business aren't covered by this local cannabis cost fees. They're, these businesses are still businesses subject to building permits, um, all of that stuff, so we don't need to incorporate those fees. So we were trying to um, figure out what, um, what sort of fees would be needed to require for, for state costs versus uh, for local costs. And as we're looking at it, I think a lot of it probably will end up falling on the state. It should be incorporated into the state uh, application and licensing fees. Uh, most of the, uh, and obviously this is, uh, so, some of this is still subject to what the what the board recommends and what the board puts in for, for regulations, but um, most of the inspections and, and most of those types of things are going to be state costs. Um, so the state, the, the, the local municipality won't really uh, incur any costs on, on, the, on that front for the most part um, under how we imagine this is playing out and how it plays out in most other cities. So what, what we're trying to capture is basically just those local costs 
of approving those facilities. So um, I might uh, turn it over here in a second to, to my colleague, Jen, because um, she's been looking into some of these other um, local fees for other entities like uh, alcohol, uh, anything involving alcohol, similar sorts of uh, uh, comparable entities in local governments in Vermont to see kind of what those fees um, are like uh, in that state. So Jen, if you if you want to jump in for a little bit and talk about what you found, uh, um, now would be now would be a good time. I think you're on mute. I'm on mute. I'm happy to talk about the fees. I think one of the biggest questions I have for the advisory board and the board um, is what are you going to consider a local fee? Like what is what does this need to cover? Um, after looking extensively at the local fees in um, in Vermont, it, there really doesn't seem to be there's not a high level of fees. I mean, you know, your largest fee in alcohol is a thousand dollars, and that's for um, the third class license, which incorporates everything. Other than that, local fees are a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. Um, the question becomes. Sorry, just to clarify, that thousand dollar fee you're talking about in alcohol isn't even a local fee. That's a state fee. It's a state fee. So, so when it comes down to local fees, there's so much less um, that if you're looking at a max level of what you want a fee to be, because you have to cover the cost, right? That's what the legislature is saying, that the, the amount of the fee has to cover the cost. The question is going to become, what is a local fee going to cover? Is it going to cover a clerk processing paper? Is it going to cover, um, you know, actual things that could come from having another business in town and I think that's really where where you need to answer the question as a board as an advisory board um, local fees for permitting for construction for things of that nature are so low I'm not sure where you want to look at for cannabis if you want to make things um, on an even keel then you're going to be looking at fees of a fifty dollars forty five dollars um, things of that nature so I do have a question Can you hear me? Hello? Can, 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 you, can you folks hear me? Yeah. All right. um, yeah, I'm having major Teams issues today, which is no surprise. Um, yeah, just not a question, but to give color on that, you know, lo local fees in Vermont, th there is certainly a local tax that some towns and municipalities have chosen to implement. So the state tax is 6%, and some towns and cities in Vermont have implemented the, what they're allowed to implement, so a 1% local option tax on top of that. Those sales taxes already exist. Presumably, those would apply when someone buys cannabis at a retail store the same way as if they buy, you know, anything else. Um, but the other local fees you're talking about, you know, in, in alcohol stuff, uh, we see small fees that are meant to cover town clerks' time to process applications. You know, thirty-five dollars for us, you know, this or twenty-five dollars for that. So those things are quite common in Vermont. Um, what I would welcome, I would ask maybe offer that the board should consider inviting um, this commentary, is I'd welcome some feedback from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, which is the organization that tends to represent uh, towns and cities, I mean, literally by, by their name. Um, I can't speak for the towns. I don't know if there's a certain cash grab they have in mind, and they're thinking, oh, cannabis is going to be huge, and we're going to put our own local 10% tax on top of that, which is probably dead out of the gate. Um, or perhaps there are specific things they are thinking about when it comes to uh, they're looking for certain revenues to help cover increased law enforcement needs or things that they are at least projecting they might want. So I, I, I would I would be curious in, in that commentary from VLCT. I agree. I, I mean, I think it'd be interesting to, to find out, I mean, honestly, why the legislature put this in there and what it's supposed to cover. But at the same time, remember that cannabis businesses are going to have to pay the fees for the build out of their establishments anyway. So they're still going to be paying the normal fees that are being charged by the cities and towns. The question is, is there going to be another fee on top of that? You know, I think if you're trying to help businesses, you wouldn't want to do that, but some people may think that this is a money grab and this is a one way to have the money grab. That's what I really think needs to be considered as the advisory board and the cannabis control board move forward talking about this um you know there's there's rhetoric on both sides treat cannabis businesses as the way you would treat everybody else and then treat cannabis businesses as a gold mine and we're just gonna do a money grab and, and charge exorbitant numbers of fees 
Vermont in and of itself doesn't have high fees. And so I think it's going to look, you know, a little onerous on the cannabis businesses if all of a sudden there are high fees that are suggested. Um, it might be that you want to suggest to the board uh, that they have a maximum level fee and that a city or town can charge anything up to that maximum level fee. Because again, trying to talk to the smallest town in Vermont might be a little bit more difficult for you with research purposes, but you know they're going to be part of, of the conversation once this starts to play out. I, I agree, Jen, and that's why I would want input from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. You know, my recommendation to the board would basically be there's no local fees unless VLCT can give us an argument for what and why they want. So, you know, I'm, I'm fully agreeing that we don't want to just let everyone see dollar signs and just go for whatever they can grab, which would just be unhealthy. I yeah, and I know, um, oh, oh, sorry, Stephanie, you can jump in. No, I was just going to say, like, the same thing. I was going to reiterate that if you're going to charge a fee, you have to charge a fee for a service or something, and we need to understand what that is. Um, in zoning regulations, when you get a permit, there's already a fee. When you go for a sign permit, there's already a fee. When you're going for, um, you know, whatever, there, there are fees in place already, so why would there be any additional fees there? Um, so I, I guess I, do, I need to also understand from the LCT what service is being provided for any fee that needs to exist. <laughs> Um, this is just a question specific to Vermont, this is Andrew here. So in some states, there are actually statutory and constitutional requirements that fees levied need to be directly tied to the administrative cost of implementing whatever service that is. In other states, that's not the case. Um, and you can just set fees um, as a kind of an adjunct way to raise tax revenue. Um, for, for those who are more familiar with the specific laws in Vermont, what is the case um, state there so the law says that after the reduction for cost for administration and collection the board pays uh, the local licensing fees <clears throat> quarterly to the municipality but to your overall question Andrew I think Vermont has a tradition but not uh, written law that okay. fees tend to be realistically tied to what they're for but I, I don't think that as an overall legal framework for the whole state that that's Okay, thank you. And so um, the, the one thing I wanted to add is that I know the, the board has already started outreach to a lot of municipal officials, um, on a survey on all sorts of uh, questions that could be um, uh, concerning or, or how their towns are anticipating it. I don't believe it covers like what they thought uh, fee costs would be, but um, I, one thing that seems to be a, a takeaway from the initial data that I saw was um, and it's something that is echoed across the um, country, we see it in every state, but that uh, muni local officials and municipal officials have a lot of uncertainty when it comes to cannabis. They have a lot of, um, uh, you know, hesitancy sometimes around cannabis, but uh, more often than not, they just aren't really sure how to handle the ha handle the issue, and especially before the regs are, are, are released. So this is a time where a lot of local officials are kind of um, you know, unsure of, of what, where their feelings are um, just due to the, the level of uncertainty. I'm sure um, Jen can speak to her experience in, in Massachusetts with that. Um, but that's, uh, so I don't know, Jen, if you had anything to add to that, but I think that's something that uh, I thought we should, we should note. No, I, I agree. I think that right now, if you talk to any town official, they're waiting to find out what their role is in all of this. Um, and so they're not sure what their actual requirements are going to be or what action items they're going to have in their towns. Um, you know, if you surveyed them right now, they probably would tell you that they're waiting for guidance um, from the board to determine what that is. So it, it might be a little early. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the, the League of Cities municipalities would know, but I think the town officials themselves yet may not understand you know what their responsibilities are going to be in Massachusetts Commissioner Doyle and I literally went around the state talking to officials boards of health and, and what have you uh, and a lot of the questions are what's our responsibility what do we do um, because as implementation moved forward the municipal level wasn't really at the forefront of you know having that conversation to determine what their role was going to be 
but so and kind of building off of all this in the previous comments from uh, Simone and Stephanie, um, it seems like uh, there's an initial uh, thought that that with Vermont's kind of tradition of low local fees and the amount of other fees, um, and then I guess we could add in kind of the um, the experience in other states where there really aren't um, as many uh, ancillary costs as are often projected before uh, before the programs are uh, are run out. Um, I think our thought would be to uh, recommend a, a, a relatively or not to recommend an exact fee, but set allow towns to set their local fee, but with a pretty reasonable cap um, uh, on on what that fee would be. Um, you know, pending obviously future conversations with the municipalities on, on what they need. But I think the idea uh, would be to cover that processing fee um, for for these applications more so than any of the other. Um, uh, potential uh, costs that could be associated for from like increased traffic flow things along those lines. Um, so Stephanie. Yeah, and no, I just wanted to. Um, I was thinking the same thing. It's just the administration of that local cannabis control board um, handling that application that feeds into the um, the state cannabis control board's issuance of that license. Um, that that fee seems like a reasonable place to start. Um, just how that's processed. Uh, anyway, thank you. And I would add for scale, just compared to other Vermont stuff, if that's what we're saying, we should be saying it's a maximum of $100, unless and until VLCT wants to come and argue. But there, there's no reason for us just saying, hey, you can charge up to $1,000 for something that doesn't even exist, unless until they can tell us what it is they're looking for and why. Um, there's really not much that's obvious compared to other Vermont industries. So I, I would have that be a very low number. Um, and if they want to come and, and advocate, I'm, I'm, I think all of us should be open to listen to what they're arguing for and why. But until then, I think it should be a pretty low dollar amount. I, 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 I agree with that. I agree with the $100 cap. I think that's a smart way to move forward and have some sort of control over it. Sounds good. All right. Um, do we know, and Jen, I don't know if you checked this, is that um, if we were doing like a statewide cap, we would want to just make sure we account for if there's different, is that the same, like is $100 reasonable in Burlington as well, or is that like, so is that? Yeah, it's, it's reasonable in, in most cities and towns. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so yeah, so that was the, um, that was mostly what we had on on kind of this local fee front. Um, we just weren't wanted to just hear from the the um, advisory members on kind of what what they thought. Uh, I I will say we probably and um, this is more I guess for for the board, um, but should have to just see if there's other things that uh, towns are are anticipating. I love I. I we think that fees should stay low, um, uh, especially at the local level. Um, but uh, I guess just it might be something to add to your uh, your, your next municipal outreach um, to the board if you to just make sure there's not any uh, major pushback there. But uh, I'm glad we have unanimous consent on the uh, on the advisory board to to go forward with the with the low cap. Um, so the last bullet point here was just about providing providing flexibilities that that was. Um, we were thinking of a cap and allowing municipalities to set it whatever below that cap, and it sounds like that's the principle um, we went with, although um, with a with a uh, pretty low um, overall uh, maximum. So, unless there's anybody else who wants to talk about local fees right now, um, we can kind of move on ahead of schedule um, to to talk about the budget and the state fees. Hearing none. Uh, first time I think we've been ahead of schedule for so far on any of these meetings. So, um, so for the now turning to the state budget again, the same requirement happens at the state level where uh, the fees are the legislature would like the fees to cover the operational costs of um, uh, of the uh, um, the the board um, going forward. 
understanding that in Vermont and every state um, and in every industry that's ever been stood up with a regulatory agency, your costs at the beginning are going to um, be higher because you have co you're, you're incurring costs well before you're actually bringing in any revenue. Um, so the other thing um, that has been uh, that can be a particular challenge that we've talked about a few times is that while the legislature originally asked for the costs uh, for the fee costs to cover all of the operational um, uh, budget, there's also been a, a more recent push and, and uh, certainly um, an, an interest in both the legislature and it seems like many in Vermont to try to provide as many low uh, low barrier to access like low. Um, low cost licenses and, and licenses for small folks. The easiest way to make back your cost would be to have a few licenses with very high costs that, that cover your operations, but that does not seem, we don't think that's a smart uh, plan for Vermont. I don't think it's a viable plan for Vermont. So um, we're gonna try to figure out how to um, cover costs and um, uh, with kind of a, a spread of licenses that both provide access and try to raise some revenue. So, uh, what we included here and I sent out earlier was the legislature during the passage of the two major uh, pieces of legislation that set up the adult use program provided uh, fiscal notes that uh, estimated the board's uh, budget over the first few years. Um, we've been in conversations with the board and uh, just from some of the things that those fiscal notes might not have incorporated. Um, it actually seems like the budgets will probably be uh, a little bit higher, at least in these early years. Um, so that we'll have to try to take it take it into account uh, a, a highly uh, slightly higher fee. Um, the other thing uh, that's worth noting from the fiscal note is that it projected a 1.8 million dollar uh, kind of uh, budget deficit by FY 24 in terms of fees, since the uh, legislation anticipates that the fees will eventually pay back all of the money that was paid up front. So. Um, Putting that all out means that uh, you're going to have to have some significant uh, fees, um, or fees that may not be super significant compared to other states, but that will seem a little bit out of line with probably the size of the Vermont market. So um, this is what we'll be presenting on uh, Thursday, hopefully, again, if we are able to get everything put together, but um, using some of Andrew's uh, projections on market size, some of our tiering recommendations, some of the things that we've talked about before. Um, we're going to try to put together uh, different fee presentations on uh, what these different tiers would be um, and a lot of Thursday's meeting and um, uh, the following Monday's meeting can be um, to talk about those. But um, all of this is kind of a, a bit of guesswork um, because we're not exactly sure on the final budget of the uh, Cannabis Control Board. Um, because both it's hard to project out what an agency budget is going to be 10 years in the future. Um, also, it's still without regulations. Uh, so depending on how that goes forward and how the agency is built, it's going to affect your budget quite a bit. So um, that's kind of where we um, where we are right now. I don't know. I can maybe uh, stop for, for questions because um, I know that probably wasn't a particularly helpful segment, but just wanted to give you a sense of like where we are for, for uh, budget, where we're going, what numbers we're going to be starting to use for, for Thursday's presentation. Um, and then we can then go on and start talking about some of uh, some of the other uh, states or, or uh, just kind of get into a general discussion of how you how you'd like to um, tier some of these things. Were there any questions on that? Dan, uh, I got a question. Sure. Sorry, this is James Pepper. Um, so it seems to me that what this is all, like the fee structure is also dependent on what types of licenses we have. I mean, we looked at a number of potential retail licenses at the last meeting that I don't think anyone was really contemplating when they wrote the legislation. And if we had, for instance, a special event retailer permit license, um, you know, that seems like a way to kind of defray the costs of some of the you know small cultivator fees etc so I, I would just not want that to get lost in the, the modeling even though you know we haven't made any decisions about those necessarily I, I do you know I, I think we're all on the same page but you know it seems like you just did a basic fee
fee structure like for all the license types that Massachusetts has, um, you'd get one fee amount. But then if you add in some of these specialty licenses or you know, craft licenses that um, Massachusetts doesn't have, that we could have a, you know, spread out the cost over more license types. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. That was going to be, I, I probably should have left with that, um, but that was my last bullet point was form of recommendations okay. was a, kind of a note to myself to, to say, I think one of the ways that we can present these recommendations is uh, like using the, the mo Andrews model um, and kind of some of the stuff that we've been thinking, we could put together a set of recommendations of if, there, if we have very basic uh, like license types, we're going to have to have these license fees that will be likely high in order to pay back um, that fee over 10 years. But what is probably a much uh, more palatable and, and what I think would be a stronger recommendation would be here's, here's license fees based on um, you know other comparable states, what we think is reasonable to enter into the Vermont market, uh, things along those lines, plus um, if we are able to, in the future, provide uh, these other license types, there's another, that'll raise additional revenue, particularly in the out years that may not have been anticipated, um, and try to get closer to the amount of uh, that total number, um, kind of using a, a more creative approach, and one that emphasizes um, trying to have more licenses of uh, easy access to many of the, um, uh, both low-level cultivators, some of the, if we can find a way to, to thread the needle on some of those kind of creative retail licenses, some of the, um, you know, event licenses or other things that aren't yet contemplated in the in this statute, but are statute, or, but are um, things that may be uh, worthwhile exploring going forward or things that I think are, are worthwhile. Um, so is that is that kind of what you're, um, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you for that. I, sorry, I short-circuited your presentation. No, no, I, um, I, I was, uh, we, we actually have some time. I budgeted more time for that local licensing uh, conversation than, I, than, than, we, than we went, so feel free to, to bring anything else up. So, um, so that, that was our plan, um, or that's what I would think. Does, does, do the rest of the um, uh, uh, subcommittee members think that that's a, a, a viable plan, like two sets of set recommendations, one based strictly on Here's what the fees would need to be if we're doing just basic licenses, trying to cover all full costs within 10 years um, based on our best estimates. And then a second one that says, if you'd like to provide additional access to the market, try to emphasize small cultivators and retail, there's a kind of creative ways to increase um, fee revenue on the out years. And I guess a very important part to mention in both the fiscal note and, uh, and in our modeling is that uh, the the uh, cannabis itself will pay for itself uh, over time? The fee, the tax revenue that's coming into the state will be um, much much larger than the uh, operating costs. Um, but it's kind of a question of whether that's going to uh, other worthy causes or or whether any of that's um, diverted to to help uh, operational costs at least in the early years. Uh, Saban. Yeah, uh, Dan, I, I fully support your idea about two sets of recommendations, um, but I would add the caveat, this is just my gut, you know, so we, we have to see, it's going to take us years to see how this actually plays out, but my gut is, there's not going to be much difference. Honestly, you know, even with the, the, the specialty licenses, those aren't going to be the lion's share of the applications we get and the few revenue we bring in. So, you know, I, I wouldn't think they're much different. I think the lion's share is going to be the meat and potatoes of everything. It's going to be a retail license. It's going to be a manufacturing license. It's going to be a grow license. Th those are what we're going to see volume in. And the other stuff, you know, we'll see how it plays out over time. But I, I would think that it's going to be concentrated in the, the ones we expect. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're probably um, uh, right on that. I think Part of it is, and again, this is for the, the board's decision and the legislature's decision. It's trying to set it up so that um, if you want, if 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 you if the legislature um, who controls the purse strings here thinks that it's uh, valuable uh, valuable to maybe not require the uh, 
not pay back the entire kind of upfront costs on the back of some of these smaller uh, guys um, and to use a little bit of the tax revenue in the first few years at least to, to kind of even out the, out the costs, um, which, I, which I think is a good plan and which most states um, most states do it because it's, it, it will we will be bringing in quite a bit of tax revenue through this um, and, and we wouldn't want to um, I think it's not uh, okay. oh, Sivan um, just a scale question Andrew if you could pull up or maybe maybe come back in five or ten minutes once you found it um, what the current model is projecting the total number of licensees will have you know I don't need to know a breakout by category but are we talking about a thousand licensees across the whole state? Are we talking about something significantly less than that, significantly more than that? That that would help some of us, yeah. at least myself, put mental scale on on what fees need to be at least in average to get to the, the numbers we're talking about. Yeah. So so right now the the model uh, looks at specifically cultivated cannabis square footage, uh, then also a little bit on a volume of uh, daily extraction capacity necessary. You know, this is gonna uh, daily extraction capacity differs quite a bit. It, you know, at 500 pounds a day, there won't be any days where you, we run out. But you probably don't want that much because obviously you just have some seasonal shifts and some some inventory can go month to month over. Um, so you're probably gonna want more like 400 uh, pounds of extraction capacity. And the same sort of thing, you know, when we're talking about cultivation square feet. Um, the dynamic there ends up being okay. Well, you know, is that 400 or 450,000 square feet divided by, you know, 200 cultivators, 300 cultivators? You know, it's like how small are each of these? <clears throat> Generally, you know, depending on how much local um, governments uh, <laughs> transition and allowing adult use, uh, what sort of limitations there are as far as time, place, and zoning with those. I think we're probably looking at somewhere in the mid hundreds. To, I, I would I would be very surprised if there's more if there's a thousand licensees across the board. Given, you're, you're talking about retail mid, mid hundreds of retail licenses to move them. Or you're saying total licenses of manufacturers, growers. I mean, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, yeah. They're probably total total. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it'll be low. I, so, and I can try to. Um, that's, a, that's a gut. That's not off of the. You know, right now we, we're not looking at how many exact retailers we need to sell um, this amount of cannabis. Yeah, I, I, I messaged back and forth with um, the commissioners on that last week um, as far as you know what it would look like for amount of volume through different storefronts. But of course, that's going to differ substantially based both um, on whichever geography you're in, um, as well as the specific season. And um, just to to provide some additional context, again, all of this is, as Andrew mentioned, is hard to hard to project. So we ran some numbers um, where we tried to figure out what the ratio of retail uh, stores would be to consumers um, based on kind of that ratio in other states. Um, so we we basically looked at total number of consumers in, in all the other states, uh, the amount of retail uh, that is that is pending in those states. So if, if somebody's been like provisionally licensed, we actually just counted as a retail in the other states as, as those markets filled out. Um, and it varied, uh, it varied significantly, obviously, but um, it looks like if if Vermont had retail stores at the, the, the state that has the most like retail stores per consumer um, is Alaska, they have a hundred, it would, if Vermont had kind of the same retail coverage that Alaska has, it would have uh, around 156.7 retail locations. Um, the lowest kind of ratio would have been uh, California. It would only have 18. Um, so I would imagine that uh, probably uh, the traditional retail locations will be in the middle. A lot of the other states, like once we started pulling this ratio, um, there's kind of a, a couple of uh, pockets, like if it was the same, uh, we should think of a term for this kind of uh, coverage, but it would be for Colorado, like the, the ratio would be um, like 79 retail locations. Um, so uh, Sivan, there might be a couple of hands raised. So uh, sorry, Sivan, on your question. 
That, 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 was, that was the old hand from the question just asked. Thank oh, you. right. Uh, was there a question in the room? Yeah, I was wondering if your estimates um, also included the fees, but, or are you considering fees for the individuals who will be working at the establishments? So, uh, I mean, it's actually included in, um, we are considering that. Uh, I hadn't reserved time for that. I didn't know if it fit into the market structure uh, conversation here, but I know it's a fee that we need to, to recommend on. Um, it was kind of a survey of some of those fees was included in the, um, in kind of the spreadsheet I sent to the, to the members this afternoon. Um, there, I mean, those are, there's less variability there. Um, and the one thing that I've, I've let uh, some of our, our co-consultants uh, co and those working on social equity, um, that's probably a pretty important question for, for them to answer. Um, if a lot of that's tied to, to background checks and trying to get people to, um, to work, in the, work in the industry, um, you probably want to keep those fees that are going on uh, employees uh, low. Um, but, uh, but again, I haven't, I haven't heard back from, from, um, from the other, um, I also haven't asked in a little while, so I'm sure, I'm sure we'll circle up when, uh, when the other uh, boards have finished having their conversations and see where, um, see where everyone is on that. So just in the medical program, um, we have something currently in statute that says that the fee, the fee and background check fee must be borne by the dispensary the establishment. Um, in your case, so they wouldn't have to, you know, somebody okay. looking for a job that's currently unemployed, you know, they may yeah, not, right. you know, they need bread and milk right now. Um, and is there, are you guys looking at a straight fee? Like, there's, is there a higher initial fee and a lower renewal fee? Um, I think. Uh, and we again this is I, I think we'll put hopefully have numbers on paper for for next uh, call but um, okay. I think for the um, uh, from what we have gathered from previous meetings uh, of this group um, I think we're going to recommend some sort of uh, provisional uh, license or some sort of like a intention to apply license that would have some sort of initial fee then we would have like an application fee and an annual fee. I don't think um, we can have, if anyone has thoughts about whether the application fee should be higher than the annual renewal fee, we can have that discussion. I generally, if, if you're trying to, there seems like there's a push to cover, um, to, to try to create lower barriers to entry. So I, I, I don't particularly love having application fees uh, much higher than than their annual cost for license, but that's a, obviously changes in different um, different states, and it's all in the spreadsheet. So we can talk about how it, what people's thoughts are on that. Alcohol in Vermont, just as an example, by proxy, uh, it's the same whether you apply the first time or renew on all the various licenses. Yeah, you know, and and if we think about it from a logistics, but also like a rationale standpoint, right? So an application fee is designed to cover the administrative costs of reviewing and adjudicating the application itself right um so that's a little separate but if we're talking about initial licensing fees or ongoing licensing fees initial licensing fees are essentially designed to help support uh the initial um creation and structure of the regulatory agency which is um going to be regulating right at, at least when it comes to cannabis in which you have a lot of essentially everyone's a new application um, and so those might need to be balanced to cover essentially the relative difference between kind of the initial startup costs of um, regulation and then the ongoing costs of those regulations. Now, ideally, as you know, a, a small state with uh, hopefully being as efficient as possible with streamlining um, regulatory oversight, we can limit some of those upfront capital costs. Um, and, and you know, work with other agencies as it comes to uh, administering on the ground inspections insofar that we can reduce the difference between initial and then renewal licensing fees. So these are some things that, that Dan and I had talked about it earlier and I, I think uh, I've been brought up a little bit to some of the commissioners in the past.
I think also you have to keep in mind the fact that you've got to cover, you know, you, you've got to have money to, for the board to operate. I mean, that's just legislatively mandated. So mm -hmm. while you try to keep fees low and try to help people, <clears throat> you also have to look at the operating costs of, of the board. It's going to be hard to balance. And then maybe one of our options, and I know now we're just kind of uh, brainstorming on the on the call, but maybe one of the options is to present, um, if we're doing two sets of recommendations, one based on one where we're tied to paying back the fee, one where we have a little bit more flexibility and are, are relying on the licenses, maybe there's a higher application fee mm -hmm. on the on the first one to, to, to make sure that we cover costs, um, and, and then you know, the application fee and the renewal fee on the, um, on the kind of second recommendation. But open to hearing from uh, subcommittee members um, on, on if they have any thoughts or, or opinions or, or anything that you want us to incorporate as we kind of sketch this out for us and before we present to next week. Chris? Yeah, I've been thinking this week, um, yeah, I keep going back to the hemp program and how a license is $25 and, you know, I'm sure Carrie or somebody at the Department of Ag has the statistics, but, you know, there's a lot of people that got a license because it was only $25 and did nothing with it. And I understand that the provisional license, especially in maybe the, the lowest tier cultivation segment, where we're considering the idea of unlimited, is being used as a device, like a barometer, to see the interest. My suggestion is that that license should be relatively, I wouldn't say expensive, but it should be a real number with maybe some lever where you can get a rebate if you decide to move forward to if we're really going to use this to gauge the interest of those of the potential unlimited micro licenses i think you may get a more accurate read if you make that license like a, a real cost and then possibly if you move forward with the secondary license that comes back to you or a part of it comes back does that make sense yeah, so so that if we are trying to gauge interest, it's not it's something that's not just a, a nominal fee. Um, some, something that uh, people need to um, pony feel up like they're real, pony up real money. Right. But then if you move forward, you get a, all of that or a chunk of that back, or you take it off the secondary cost of the the final license. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, any other members have have thoughts on that. I think that's definitely a way to. Um, to, to uh, and I would want to not just have that for um, the low level licenses, have that for kind of all of the licenses. So there's no, if that's where, where we go, it should be, you know, probably a standard provisional license fee of, yeah. of some real money um, and then have a, a, a discount or have that extended over. Um, I, agree, I, I agree, but I, I, I don't think we're speculating with the other tier licenses, specifically in cultivation, um, that it's really an ongoing concern of how many people are going to apply for these other tiers. But, uh, you know, I keep thinking about these unlimited licenses and how to really grasp what we're looking at. Um, you know, a couple hundred is doable, if, let's say, which is probably unrealistic. You have a thousand of the micro licenses, like, you know, what does that mean for the control board, reg reg regulations, um, enforcement, like, um, you know, I'm really curious to see what the interest is on that micro level. Yeah, does anyone have any thoughts on what, or like, should we have a discussion about what is a, is a reasonable fee there that allows the folks in, but doesn't allow, that doesn't have people just filing and not, uh, not going forward? I, I fully support what Chris just said, um, and I would take one part maybe a little up, level further. We don't necessarily need to think about rebates so much as we could think about if we're to think about giving any of that money back, it could just be credits forward to the next license. Yeah. Or, you know, make make people think about that early fee as a non-refundable deposit, so they have to be serious. And you know, again, just speaking to gut numbers, it seems to me that nothing should be less than five hundred bucks if you're trying to get people to take it seriously. Um, but I don't know if that's. I'm, I'm literally making that up, but that's just a number that feels like people take that seriously in a way that they don't take $25 seriously. Yeah, I just keep going. I agree with you, Savon. I keep going back to the HAMP program, and I think that low license fee was, you know, it, it was the worst part about it. I mean, it just started off on the wrong foot. I got a question. So the, just to provide some perspective on the HAMP program, um, 
in 2019 we did have and it was a $25 fee it's no longer $25 it's been increased but um, we had I think 1300 total registrants and a portion of those were considered processors of hemp um, and we had 9,000 acres booked for cultivation however not all 9,000 acres were cultivated <laughs> um, today we have about 343 registrants um, total uh, with the hemp program I don't have the grower number off the top of my head but maybe Andrew remembers those numbers <laughs> oh, I can pull them up for you they're my model but your point Stephanie is that you went from 1300 to 350 right Yes, no, definitely. That um, that's what I've said. Yes, definitely. I, I, I will there's, add. There's market there too. Like you know, yeah. we're still sitting on hemp from 2019. So, but yeah. yeah. There was a market crash in the intervening <laughs> year, not just a fee increase. Yeah, but I think I think that all uh, makes sense. We certainly don't want everybody in the state. Um, I don't think throwing in $25 or, or whatever. So if, if I think um, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, to me. I wouldn't want to go uh, too high, but also we do want, these are going to be uh, something that the board's going to have to look at and, and, and process and just for their own work, uh, they should not have too many frivolous applications, um, try to make sure that the people who are um, applying and, and these things have to be reviewed are, uh, you know, committed to, to moving forward. Well, I would also suggest, Dan, that once the board is actually enacting this, to, um, you know, the, those early indication of interest things with the, you know, call it a non-fundable deposit or whatever, um, you can encourage people to put those in by saying that the order in which those go in will be the order in which the eventual permits will be reviewed. Um, so you can have people waiting on the sidelines, uh, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea too. I know. Um, I think the uh, and I, I think I saw that uh, Gina joined. But if if and I know um, NACB was looking, um, I think at some of the prioritization and, and some of the other things related to um, social equity or, or things like that. So I, I imagine that there's um, there'll be some uh, some input from from those folks on on how to prioritize going forward. But uh, I think that's a good point. And so just then at this time, I know that we were going to try to get the um, for social equity licenses priority. Okay, yeah, so um, we'll have to iron out exactly how to prioritize, but maybe we figure out social equity plus, you know, then then in order of, uh, of filing or, or however we want to, however we want to structure it, but we'll make sure that we um, incorporate the recommendations of groups. Uh, any more um, thoughts on this? I know we uh, are now approaching time, and I don't know if there's public comment uh, in the in the room at all. I didn't see any uh, online submitted public comment, um, so uh, we don't probably need to reserve any uh, time there. But um, so we might have a few extra minutes here for, for further discussion. But um, just want to pause and see if there's going to be a, ten minutes of public comment. Uh, I think we have one member of the public that would like to make a comment. Uh, okay, yeah, let's, um, why don't we do that now and if there's a, a few minutes afterwards and if anyone from the other board members have uh, more uh, questions, we can jump back on it. Uh, thank you, it's uh, Dave Silverman. Um, first, really appreciate the progress uh, since last week. Uh, and uh, the creativity uh, reported at your last Thursday meeting on license types. Um, second, the, um, the idea of a, a $500 uh, provisional license application uh, doesn't scare me in terms of you know, thinking what uh, my uh, small cultivator clients uh, might be able to afford. I think $500 is a level that uh, folks can afford um, and folks who are going to be investing in a uh, licensed cannabis business are going to need to be able to come up with. Um, so uh, that doesn't scare me. The what what does kind of what what did kind of take me back was the, the idea that the order of submission 
of the provisional license applications or even the order of submission of full license applications would set the order of review. And, and I just don't want you to create an incentive for people to rush their applications. Speaking as someone who will be preparing those applications for clients, I want to make sure that we have time to go over it, present you guys with full, truthful information, and not just slapdash something together to get it in so that we get reviewed quickly. You know, I, th I think we want to present you guys good applications, and good applications just will take a little bit of time, especially since they're there really are not very many lawyers working in this industry right now in Vermont. And so, you know, we're not going to be able to, you know, the, the, the three, four, ten of us, however many there are, just not going to be able to give you hundreds of good applications in a matter of a week if everyone's pressing right away to, you know, get mine in, get mine in, get mine in, because they feel there's going to be a, a, a time benefit there. Um, so I, that's, that's the one thing that I just wanted to give you back. Thank you. That's hey. great feedback, Dave. I, I, I appreciate hearing that as a person who suggested putting things in in order, and, and maybe there's something to be considered for, you know, a, a more chunky version of early versus late. You know, kind of like college role admissions. You know, may, maybe maybe there is, you know, people who get in in the first month are in the first wave of being reviewed, and the second month is later. So you know, still not wait forever, but something along those lines maybe makes a little more sense than how I originally presented. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to follow up on that as, as I think I also brought up the idea, um, you know, or, or at least I ha had the idea, uh, I may have not brought it up in last comment, um, but ordinarily when I'm doing these things, not necessarily thinking about the supply of attorneys on cannabis in the state of Vermont, which is, I totally recognize, far smaller than it is in, in other states. So, so totally understand supply and demand on that regard. We don't have any other public comment in the room. All right. Was there any? Um, thank you. Was there any other? Uh, anything else from any of the the subcommittee members that they want to bring up now? Um, Stephanie, I see you have a question. Yeah, I was just I was looking at the Massachusetts licensing um, tiers, and it, you know the first one is one square foot up to five thousand. Are there going to be minimum? Like, would we really want to go through the application process? And maybe I'm interpreting this wrong, but should there be a minimum size for true cultivation that's not a single square foot? Um, I, I don't think, uh, again, we've, we'll, we'll talk about this more on Thursday. I, I don't know, and I haven't talked really to, to, um, to, to Andrew or Jan or anyone else on my team about this. I know Jeff uh, brought it up a little bit on the last call. I was thinking that, um, we would just set it at you know no minimum and assume that the cost going forward would be enough to to make people not apply for a, a, a license to to grow two plants. But if if we feel that there's some sort of um, reasonable minimum square footage requirement that we want us, um, I, I think that's certainly something that we could we could discuss. I want to create like a tier of like you know one to ten square feet um but but like if um but if you think that the the uh the statutorily defined small cultivators isn't like defined uh small enough um we can we can certainly discuss that no no i was thinking that that would be the smallest a thousand square feet right maybe not i'll let others like below a thousand in the statute, I think we're required to have a, a, a below a thousand square feet, oh, right? Okay. Um, Sivan? Yeah, I, I, I would advocate we don't necessarily strip minimums, but that all the tiers are up to X. Um, and I don't think that as you go higher, the next tier has a minimum that is the previous tier's maximum, right? If, if it's up to a thousand and then up to five thousand and then up to fifteen thousand, whatever it is. That's good because you want to give people the ability to apply for higher levels as they, you know, they're up to a thousand and they're growing 800, 900 square feet and they're feeling pretty good about it and say, you know what, I'm going to apply for the 5,000 license and start thinking about planning more and give them the ability to get ahead of that um, so that we don't force people into weird, uh, you know, bending over backwards to fit into X or Y at the right time. And, um, and I totally agree, Dan, to the point of it, not necessarily even licensing fees, but 
just the process of licensing and the other requirements when it's going to come to what you need to do for compliance to be eligible, those things will be enough to, to people will be encouraged to only do this if they're going to be serious about it. And that's going to keep someone wanting to do five plants out of it because it's not going to be worth it to someone who wants to do five plants to think about the background check and the other compliance and the license fee, et cetera. So I don't think we have to worry about minimums. Yeah, and I know um, it's probably a little too late to get into it, but Andrew, I know, has a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge and thoughts about it. You're exactly right about it. We wouldn't set like a minimum on those up tiers because um, most folks don't cultivate to the up to the maximum. Um, you know, uh, so uh, definitely aligned on on that. And you always you always want to give a business the opportunity to choose their pausing things, right? So if someone was a uh, one thousand to five thousand and they have some you know, utility problems and they need to stop cultivating and now they're not in compliance because they're less than a thousand, that, that would be an unintended you know, disaster, right? So. Yeah, so yeah, our, our, our total, um, it would just be for the, the, and you would think, yeah, let the business decide which tier they want to be in um, and pay for the, the increased licensing fee, but not, not necessarily dictate that they have to maintain a certain, uh, certain capacity. Yeah. As it pertains to for the two states are probably most analogous to look at for this, uh, Colorado and Massachusetts, which both have the program and also have the requirement that if you want to bump up tiers, you have to show that you're growing at or around your plant limit and selling about 85% or more of what you cultivated. In both instances, there is the ability for the regulatory agency to drop people down a tier. Uh, it's less explicitly stated how it would be done it would only be done at renewal but if someone is only growing you know 20 to 30 percent of what they you know can grow and they're at tier you know eight out of ten or whatever you know that we drop down and there's usually a longer conversation and discussion about that i imagine jen um jen flanagan has some some more first uh first-hand experience in that, um, but I think that's probably the appropriate way to do it, where you don't say this, you know, at this point, they would exactly drop someone down, but you give the board the ability to drop someone down if they have vast amounts of underutilized capacity that they're not intending to actually cultivate, as that is kind of essentially extra string on the marionette when it comes to understanding the, uh, uh, the movement of the industry. Honestly, I'd rather not um give the board that to think about or worry about. I'd rather that if the higher tiers of cultivation, for example, cost more, that people have their own financial incentive to you know, get the one they think they're gonna use, and if it's a year later and they still ha aren't using you know, all 10,000, that when it's time to renew, they choose to drop down to 5,000. You know, I mean, it, it's certainly always possible that the board upon renewal can say, you're not approved for 10,000 because you're not using anywhere close to it. Um, but I'd rather not give them that thing to have to think about or supervise, unless the board feels otherwise, obviously. I mean, the way we do it in Massachusetts, it's a safety thing. If you can't sell 85% within the last six months, then for us, it was more of a, we're not gonna let you divert, so we're gonna drop down your tier. Um, it wasn't so much that we wanted to do that, but it was people were getting in at, at tiers they thought they would be able to handle, and if they couldn't, then, the, then we decided as a commission that that's what the action was going to be at renewal immediately. There was, there'd be no conversation to be had. If, if your numbers show that you weren't selling the product, you're going down the tier. Um, any other final thoughts before we, uh, before we wrap up? Um, <clears throat> well, missed it by one minute on, on being perfectly on time, so I'll take that as a victory. Um, yeah, and I'll just share, uh, Nellie and Bray already know this, but I'm going to be unable to make it on Thursday. Okay, uh, I will make sure that we uh, get you all the materials, and um, uh, lucky for you, I anticipate that we'll probably have a conversation that will extend for, uh, for, for the next two calls, um, so we'll probably be covering, um, we'll be able to catch you back up a week from today. Uh, and get your input. All right. Um, so with that, I will. Uh, I, I'm to to adjourn for the day. Motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. And have a great evening. We'll talk to you in a couple of days.